The beauty of courage, in my view, is that when you act with courage, with authenticity, with um, truth, it is phenomenally powerful. You can't, it can't be faked. It can't be, you know, it can't be disputed because it has, I think, a, um, an undeniable truth to it. Because the magic that lives on the other side of courage is, is just spellbinding. Let's talk courageous communication. Today, the Sai Atkins. Have you ever lost your mojo? Would you like to know how to get your mojo back? How is it linked? to being courageous. Is it the same? Is it different? We are going to have the privilege of hearing from Sai Edkin, the Mojo coach. Um, he's also a leadership business coach and he's done a number of speeches and he trains speakers. He's spoken in front of thousands of audiences, even on TEDx. He's even written a book called The Art of Courage, Debunking the Myth Around Courage. So let's hear some more and learn about having courageous conversation with Sai Edkin. Welcome, Sai. It's so great to, to have this time with you um, because I think we both have such a passion for courage in, in one way. But the thing with you that I find really interesting is you use the term mojo a lot in, in the work that you do. And you also have a thing about cycling. I used to cycle quite a bit, so <laughs> quite interesting. I don't think I've ever done the distances you have because you've done many kilometers um, in some of your cycling trips. And somehow that is linked to Mojo. So I was hoping you would start off by telling us what Mojo is because it's, it's a lovely word, um, but I don't know if many people understand it. So what is Mojo? And tell us the story then of how your cycling has led you to be so focused on this concept of, my, of mojo. Oh, great. Thanks, Tala. It's a real pleasure to be here and have this conversation with you. Thank you for the opportunity. So, um, you know, mojo is a bit like love. You know, it's very subjective. But, but you know, if I said, what's your definition of love? You might say intimacy, connection. And I go, oh, great. Yeah, me too. And here's my definition of love. And you'll probably go, yeah, oh, me too, right? <laughs> so it's... it's um, it's it's subjective and whatever answer you give is perfect however from a from a like a, a clarity perspective i'll give you my my current title and i'll give you my current working title i'm constantly kind of innovating and and creating and shifting which has its own lightness and its own darkness of course but so so if you said what's mojo i'd say the acronym peach which stands for passion energy authenticity, confidence, and humor. Or, or just pick one of those, passionate, energetic, confident, humorous. You're, you're going to be in your mojo state. But still, it's actually quite subjective. Like, okay, well, what does energy mean? What does passion mean? What is, you know, so, so my kind of working title is mojo is fully, is when we are fully, powerfully engaged in the present moment. So here you and I are talking, and I'll speak for me and probably for you, but this is all this is all there is. This is it. You know, whatever happens in when we're finished or what happened before, my children are at school, my wife's upstairs, but actually I give myself, I hope, I fully and powerfully engage in this conversation because that to me is mojo because if I'm not doing that in this conversation or the next conversation or the next conversation, I'm not in mojo and I'm what, what am I waiting for? You know, because all we have, I think, is this moment. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And so I was going to say a yeah. very interesting or useful state to be in, fully engaged with whatever you you're doing. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. You know, and and um, we might digress. We will digress, I have no doubt. But uh, Johnny Wilkinson, I, I don't know if that name means anything to you. He was a, 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 a well-known uh, English rugby player and he helped win the World Cup and so on and so forth. And he, 
he really turned out like so many sports people is that he was under massive pressure when he was performing and and a lot of it self-induced you know uh, not good enough wanting to be the best all of that stuff and he he had this kind of what's called a Yoda moment where he kind of like he came out on this podcast for like 90 minutes and really spilled the beans on himself which was really beautiful actually it was very authentic and, and and a really lovely podcast and he and he said you know what's the difference between winning a world cup and doing the washing up nothing <laughs> nothing and his his whole thing is about engagement you if you're engaged in the washing up or engaged in winning a world cup or engaged in training or engaged in drive that's you know that to, to my point i think that's really what mojo is Okay. So in, in terms of, of the Mojo piece, and, um, you know, I let, let me just take a, a bit of a backtrack, if I may, because you, you and I have been kind of come together through this, this beautiful word, courage. And it's been a really interesting journey uh, because in 19, uh, I don't know if the listeners will, will, it might be useful to have some perspective kind of, oh, I was born here, yeah. went here, did this, did this, did this. And there's a there's a video which I sent you, which I would invite you to maybe put in the show notes so that people can, I would just click on, pause this video now, click on that, and then you go, oh, okay, this is who he is, and this is what he done, and this is where the cycling fitted in, and so on and so forth. And my one of my kind of key moments in my life was um, getting on a bus in uh, Brixton in South London, which is a kind of rough, tough part of town, and it was 11.30 one night, I was on my own. And I had this, what I suppose can be described as an epiphany, where I summoned all my courage and got up. Uh, it was a, it was dead silent, completely full bus. Uh, you know, the streets outside in Brixton were pumping at 11.30 on a Friday night. And the yeah. contrast with people being on this bus, dead silent. And I remember thinking, what? going on here like the contrast was so obvious you know and then I had this idea well make a speech mix it up a bit see what happens you know and so I made a speech and that's a story for a slightly longer day but when it, or a story for another day is that when I got off the bus I got off a different person still the same person but I, I had seen the possibility of what courage makes available Stepping outside, in my case, you know, doing what one fears the most and then being really, really surprised by the outcome. And so that was in, in 1999. In 2011, I, um, I walked into a, a bookshop in Hout Bay here in Cape Town and I picked up a leaflet and it said, write a book in 90 days and my wife was considering writing a book so i picked up the leaflet for her and i took it back and i said you know here this might be of interest to you didn't think anything more of it 90 days later she tapped me on the shoulder and says right well i've written my book what are you going to do and i knew <laughs> instantly i was going to do that speaking on the bus thing so i did 90 consecutive talks to random groups of strangers on buses petrol stations restaurants you know, gymnasiums, saunas, that's always my personal favorite. Um, nothing like <laughs> of, you know, naked, compromised men and giving a message. But, so, so, so I did these 90 talks and the essence was promoting courage by facing my own, because every time I did it, every time I do it, it's still like boom, 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 you know? Yeah. And, um, and so that then kind of kicked me off on this thing of courage. And I was like, wow, courage. This is it, you know, and I could see myself speaking all over the world on courage and fantastic. And, and I'm really curious to know how your journey of courage is going. And then expecting the phone to kind of ring off the hook. But nothing really happened. And, and it was perplexing to me because whenever I spoke about courage to people, it was absolutely universally met with great enthusiasm. Mm. You know, you should speak to the government, you speak to the UN, you should be on a world tour, you should be like, bah, 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 bah. And, and I was deafened, deafened by the silence. And 
you know, I, I started to look at that and someone, I did a marketing course about two years ago and the person who was a very experienced marketer said, your problem is that when you talk about courage, particularly as men has been my market for a long time, you're feeding into the fragile male ego that says, I didn't need courage. I was courageous 10 years ago. I, I know all about courage because we don't, we don't want to necessarily admit that we're not courageous. So the opposite, of course, of courage is fear, right? And, and I judge that as human beings, we are mostly in a state of fear. Mm. And so I then shifted <laughs> courage to mojo, and mojo became, it's, it's, uh, it's met, the, the, the market has met it more abundantly because it's kind of cheeky and it's Austin Powers and it's a little bit irreverent and it's funny and what does it really mean? And it kind of taps into our, our innate like energy. So, um, so that's really the mission that I'm on now. And I, and I also want to say, just say finally, is that, you know, my, I, I shifted from courage to, I've always really mostly worked with men. I then shifted my messaging to uh, helping men get their mojo back. And again, like pretty deafening silence from the market. <laughs> and I, I came across a guy the other day who described himself uh, as a, a man whisperer. Okay. And I was like, oh boy. Like I, I, for me as a, as, a, as a kind of fairly straight up uh, heterosexual guy, the idea of, of a man kind of whispering in my ear was like, yeah, <laughs> and I'm sure it works. Well, it works for some people, but I saw. I, I I think I saw a bit of myself, like helping men get their mojo back, and I can see men going, eh, "I don't need that." So now I've expanded my offering to helping people to find, keep, and regain their mojo, and and there's again, there's just a far more energetic response. So that's a little bit of my the inner workings for me. I, I think. I know you, it seems like you're really curious to know about the cycling trip uh, because of being a cyclist yourself. But, but it seemed, from what I read about you, it seemed to somehow start this journey or be linked to the mojo and the, and the courage piece. So that was just the... It could be Because, I mean, you've coached, what, 13,000 kilometres from Cape Town to the UK. Um, and I know in somewhere else I read you also did a, another ridiculous amount of time on a bicycle when you were a teenager to just go see a girl. <laughs> and that for me is courageous. That is, you know, about fully trying to live wholeheartedly and make the most of, yeah. of the time and create these experiences to, to explore this world and meet other people. And on a bicycle, you just see the world totally different than you do in a car or a um, airplane, you know, flying. You could have flown flown to London. So I just wondered, yeah, if there is a connection with Mojo, your interest in Mojo and courage. Yeah, thank you. I, it's a really good question, actually. Like, where where did it start, and has it always been like this? And you know, without going into kind of tomes and tomes and chapters of a of a, of a five hundred page book, you know, it's like it's really curious. I, I think you know what comes to my mind is. I think I'm very lucky um, in many regards. You know, my my parents used to say, uh, bless him, comparing myself to my older brother, uh, which is you know, <laughs> two prisoners in a cell looking out through, you know, through the bars. One saw bars, the other saw stars. And I've always yeah. just, my wiring, I guess, whatever, yeah. is I've always seen the stars. No, not always. I've mostly seen the stars, which I think kind of equips me well with, the mojo piece, but also don't be fooled, right? Because there are times where I'm absolutely not in my mojo at all. You know, it's like, where did it go? How do I get back, right? And so I'm, I'm both the student and the teacher with regard to to mojo. Um, but I think if I look back on it, on the common themes in my life, I think I've, hmm, I think I've, I've seen opportunities and grabbed them. Uh, with both hands not always but the ones ones that have got me to where i've got to so for example um the the my 
what kind of really was a, a, a significant event in my life was when, as teenagers, we were shipped off to a, to a sailing school in the south coast of, of England and got up to all sorts of mischief. We were, weren't very supervised and, you know, 14, 15, 16 year olds getting up to all sorts of nonsense and uh, mostly dragging our feet and, and doing all the things we shouldn't have done. And then one day the instructor, an instructor came in to the caravan and said, oh, hi everyone, like who's gonna come with, who's gonna come for a run with me? And I was like, like everyone, eh, mm, <laughs> you know, carry on lying on the couch, you know. And something just said, just go. And I, I said, yeah, yeah, as he was leaving the door, I said, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. And I went, and then just something, something like just happened in my body. And I was like Forrest Gump. I just couldn't stop <laughs> running, you know. And um, and it was really funny because the, the 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 year before in the school cross-country race, I'd come out of a school of about 600. I think I came about 420th or something. And then the next year, I came first. Like, wow. How did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so... So it was kind of fueled by that. And then um, I, because I, I was getting into fitness, I got into bicycling and that was cool. And then I, I went skiing one year uh, and, uh, you know, met this this young girl. You know, we were, I, I was 16, I think she was 15. Um, it was all very innocent, nothing really happened, but we exchanged addresses and we wrote to each other in those days when you wrote like the green envelope and the pink envelope and it had half <laughs> on it and you, uh, you know, and she was at school in the in the north of Scotland, and and I just had this idea, like, oh, why don't why don't I bicycle to see her? That'd be wow, that'd be an adventure, and so I did. It was a complete failure, you know, on the face of it, because when I got there, she completely ignored me. Um, I think it was just too much for her. I could see her family. Yeah, he's going to be here tomorrow. He's cycling all the way from the south of England to see. It's like ah, it must have been too much for that. <laughs> Um, but, but I think it's the experience, jumping into the experience, uh, that is what really counts. And I'm very grateful that I've been able to jump into experiences where, um, where perhaps many others don't, or perhaps if I, if I flip the coin another way, I'm, I might not do, you know, but I found that being in, uh, jumping into those situations has absolutely paid off even when it hasn't so for example you know going to see you know lady louisa in the north of scotland it was a heroic failure what was the what was the goal what was the gift the gift of adventure i thought it was all about when i get there it's going to be like you know i created all these fantasies yeah. as well as, and you know pack my three-piece tweed suit in the in the bicycle bag <laughs> and the and the you know brogues with the shoe trees in them i mean crazy you know <laughs> But but I I had the most amazing adventure. I met uh, someone at a youth hostel who is my my oldest, closest female friend to this day. You know, would never have met her. So then one thing led to another. I did the bicycling trip. I was then flying over East Africa when I left school. I went to India on my own. That was another really really you know I went on my own and it was pretty scary and uncertain. But it was one of the smartest things I did because. When you're on your own, you have, you're forced to connect and meet and connect with people. And, and I think in a world, and something I want to talk to you about at the end, particularly around kind of what's a message out there in the world, you know, I, I think in a world that seems to be becoming increasingly divided and separate, mm. um, opportunities to connect, I think, are, are where, you know, really where the gold lives. And then, and then the, the final part I'll just say around the cycling trip is that I was, I was then flying from uh, Bombay to Harare in 1986. And, and I've always had a thing about sitting in a, an aisle seat on a plane, but there didn't, weren't any aisle seats, so I was sitting in a window seat and I was grumpy, you know, because it's not what I want to be. So I'm sat in this thing and I'm, I'm eating my chicken curry and I'm looking out the window and I see this kind of settlement below hills and I can see it quite clearly in rivers and, and villages. And I, I remember it was as quick as this. I remember looking out and I went, God, that looks amazing. It'd be amazing to do that on a bike. Hang on a second. I've got connections in South Africa. I've got connections in England. Oh, I'm going to bicycle from England to South Africa. And then I just carried on eating my curry. And that was it. It was as simple as that. And then, you know, there came a time when, when, I, when I did that. 
Wow, that's like fascinating. And so a lot of what you've learned then um, is from these adventures, from putting yourself in situations or, or t acting on a thought. It's one of the first part and then seeing it as an adventure and learning. Because I think that it's, it's just so powerful. You know, what I know about confidence is we only learn confidence from doing. So if you want to become more confident in, in your life and your capacity to deal with life, you need to get out there and deal with life. And what better way than to intentionally put yourself in, in a different culture or in a, in a, a situation of a, adventure because it definitely builds our, builds our capacities. Yeah. So, so going back then to the mojo capacity, right? Because that's um, quite interested, this um, fully in, and powerfully engaged in whatever you're doing and you, you've got that peach aspect to it, that acronym. And um, we talk a lot about losing our mojo. So maybe just to start there is like, how do we lose it? And then I love the quote you used that you used to explain how you can gain it back, which is that quote from Shakespeare. Maybe we can just talk a bit about that. How do we lose our mojo and how can we get it back again? Sure. So <clears throat> I think we, we have a thought and then another thought and then another thought and then we've lost our mojo, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're not engaged. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I, I know I, you know, I can only I, I can speak most authoritatively on my own experience is that when I when I notice that thought of like you know, pick your pick your lane, you know, X Y Z odds, oh, you know, all the problems that we face in the world, you know, whatever those are, pick your pick your ticket, you know, is it's really easy to believe that, and um, and so. You know, if I have a belief that, oh, that, you know, business is really difficult and there's and, and people aren't going to buy my services, well, I'll be right. And then all of my thoughts that follow that and my actions that follow that will be right. And there it is. And there's the proof, right? So for me, getting out there, getting out, whatever getting out there means, picking up the phone, having a, starting a conversation in a queue, um, taking a risk, calling a, a prospective client, we are just always richer for it. So, so I think. So, does that answer your question in terms of how we lose our mojo? We we have a thought, you know. I I remember speaking to a friend of mine many many years ago, and I was complaining about something like my dad or something, and he said, "So you had a thought about your dad?" I was like, "Yeah." He was like, "That's it." So, what was that thought about your dad? Oh, my dad's an asshole. Oh, okay. So, how to go after that? Yeah, it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> um now so so in terms of you know let's say that the default is we're going to lose our mojo really easily and we're really good at losing our mojo oftentimes you know we'll be in a situation where we're like flying you know on the crest of a wave you know business relationships ah oh, so great and it's like how did this happen because what i'm really interested in is how can we create it how can we how can we be a master of being back in the mojo state? Mm. So, so but the acronym mojo uh, I describe as follows: the M is for magic. Yeah. The O is for obstacle. The J is for jump or jump in, and then the last O is for observe. If we lose the magic, we're dead in the water. And when I say magic, it's like, what is, what is, the, what is the possibility? What, is, what can I create in this moment? What would I love to have happen? You know, um, I asked you before, you know, what would you love to get out of this podcast together? And you, you, we spoke about some things. And, and that was really important to me to know what's the magic for you out of this, because then I can help you, right? And, and vice versa. And, and so what is the magic? And, and you know, one of the things that um, 
I was listening to a, a piece by uh, Neil McDonald Walsh this morning. He's the author of uh, Conversations with God. Uh, have you have you read that book? The first one. Uh, I haven't read it, but I know of it. Yeah. Really, really, really good. But this was him like 25 years later. And he was asked, and this is me jumping to the end as well. He was asked, you know, what is the biggest problem in the world? You know, with geopolitics and education, and the economy and all healthcare. And what he said just is like, yep, that's it. Well, you see what your reaction is, right? So he said, the biggest problem in the world is our separation. Yeah. You know, in South Africa, biggest but like the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the and the chasm builds, right? And then and if we if we wanted to, we could fix this economy, we could fix hunger in, in a week. Like ancient history, done, right? But we lose the magic. The magic is the connection. The, the the fact that we are one you know if you look at you know those those five fingers they all look very different and very disconnected right but they're guess what they're part of this organism and this organism energetically it scientifically is that is connected with you in Joba, right we are one together for as long as i bring the separation you're different to me i'm better than you you're better than me you got to follow my religion. You got to follow my doctrine. We've created separation. So the magic is in getting back to, you know, oneness and wholeness and connection. Uh, so that's that's what I mean by magic. And then and then we go, okay, well, there's the magic. And then yeah, but right, <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and, but. You go, and the ego, there's the ego. There it is. Right. Yeah, but it's difficult. I've tried before. I, I'm not qualified enough. I don't know enough. I've failed before. All that stuff. Right. And yeah. then we just we just observe that. It's just chattering. It's like leaves in an autumn day. Just but we relate to those obstacles like it really is the truth. So we observe them and then jump. What is the jumping in? pick up the phone, have the conversation, take a risk, sing a song, do a dance, whatever it happens to be. Because when we, when we act, it's, it's really showing the universe, okay, we're in. And then the, the last O is observe. Okay, so what worked, what didn't work? What am I grateful for? What do I acknowledge myself for in the process? So that's my, my kind of take on how to practically get our mojo back but if we don't go to the magic first then that's that's the that's the golden ticket yeah. What's the magic result here what do i want what do i what would i love to ask for what would i love to request and i think so it's so often we probably lose the magic because we lose touch of that because we actually don't give ourselves permission to contemplate never mind ask for what we want Absolutely. there's very few of us that um know what it is that we want and then give ourselves permission to go for it so like intentionality, I'll talk about that as well. well. Like, What's your intention behind what you're doing? What, you know, because if you understand that purpose, it's way easier to do, to jump. You know what I mean? The, the purpose fuels courage. We, 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 courage is never activated if there's no reason behind it. Well said. So, um, so I love that. So we know what mojo is and how to get mojo back. Um, there's a part of it, though, the, the, the quote from Shakespeare, and it's maybe just because it will touch on another aspect of, of all that we talk about is um, Shakespeare said, above all, to thine own self be true. So it links, I suppose, to be at thy own self be true, to being true to your aspirations, you know, what works for you, what you want in terms of your, your life and your, the quality of life and what you want to do with your time on this earth. Um, but also links to to that um, be true that part of um, to thy, thy what to thine own self be true links a bit to authenticity. So I wonder if you can touch a bit on on how you see this concept of being authentic because I find it's it's really important and yet misunderstood. Mm. And simple, but far from easy. Yes. No, I think um, so. 
that word selfish, you know, it's it, it, when we're accused of, I'll speak for myself and possibly for you and listeners, but, you know, when I'm accused of being selfish, it's not a good feeling. Mm. And yet the paradox is, unless we're selfish, selfish, not selfish, but <laughs> selfish, like that's the way I see it, is self, or another way of saying it is self-care. Yeah. Because, you know, it's the old, you know, the famous old thing of the, the when the airplane drops temperature, you put it on yourself first. The mask, you, yeah, oh, oxygen, yeah. And, um, and it's, it's, um, it's very interesting that um, as I've been rereading this, this book, Conversations with God, he makes a huge, God makes a huge amount of references to the importance of, of being selfish and following, because when you, when you honor yourself, you're actually going to make a far bigger difference to the people in your life, your community, your, your business. Um, but often what we do is, of course, we don't put ourselves first. You know, and, and I think, and then there's a, a kind of, generally speaking, a kind of male, female, I judge that most men are takers and most women are givers. As a, I don't know if that's true, but that's how it feels for me. And so what I observe, particularly around women is, you know, particularly being mums and giving, giving, giving others, 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 giving, 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 giving. It's like, eventually it's like, ah, enough, you know. <laughs> Um, and and I mean, as a man, my my um, uh, what's the term uh, ball and chain, I suppose I could say in this regard, you know, from an upbringing perspective, as I was brought up as a you know as a, a a polite young English person, you know, and you don't speak the truth, you know, you don't you don't ask for what you need, you you don't uh, you don't say it like it is. Um, D.H. Lawrence wrote a poem called The English Are So Nice. And, and <laughs> basically the gist of the, of the poem is the English are so nice, but it's such a shadow because there's such darkness and behind the nice, you know, the grinning nice. And what's going on in the background, it's like, yeah. <laughs> the middle finger uh you know but we'll you know in, in english cases you know we'll we'll take over your country and we'll make you feel really good about how you've given it to us you know um so so the the importance of honoring oneself and saying these are my needs I th these are my authentic needs is so powerful and so important i would say that we can't get to our mojo if we don't honor ourselves first and it's really hard because we've all been conditioned selfish is bad and we've got to look after others and you know there is no i in team and all of this kind of stuff but actually it's um i would say it's it's time for a change you know because mm. i think what you're saying when we honor ourselves it doesn't mean we dishonor others and I think that's the, you know, you're talking about the, the disconnection. It's a lot of black and white. People seem to think that if you're doing one thing, it means you can't do it. You know, you're doing the opposite. Of, or So I love them living more in a, in a multidimensionality. Like, how do we honor ourselves and the other um, at the same time? And that's what I think you're talking about. So understanding our authentic needs and honoring them absolutely it's kind of a bit of a paradox because on the face of it selfish looks selfish and it's all about me and it's not about others but if it's done with authenticity it means that there'll be time you know where, where, where i will honor your whatever you know is authentic for you um and then everyone wins but if i'm saying mm. yes 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 but i'm actually thinking no 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 i'm i'm basically being I'm bringing insincer insincerity into the equation, and that's that's a real zero sum game. Yes. So part of that then is is how do we also live more courageously? Because it takes courage, I think, to be able to ask for our needs, to be in touch with our authentic needs, and then request that they be met, or just to, as you say put ourselves first so that we can meet our needs so that we are full to be with, you know, other people. So um, 
how would you say this um, being fully engaged, this mojo, help us to, to live more courageously? How does it fit in? Well, I think, um, you know, if you look at the, I always find it useful to look at the, the um, origins of a word, you know, courage comes from the Latin core, meaning heart, as you probably know, uh, and aj meaning movement. So it's movement from the heart. And, you know, it's really interesting in this, I, I judge, quite rightly changing world, you know, where, um, you know, these words like um, white male privilege and all of that stuff, you know, and I think it's, what's happening is it's, it's change, you know, and you can either resist change or you can move with it and, 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 and inquire and be curious about change. So I noticed for myself that sometimes I judge myself for saying, well, you know, of course I can be courageous. I'm a white male. I can get away with murder. You know, like, I mean, what I mean by that is, you know, I was brought up in a, you know, as a, as a middle class English person. You know, my father was a clergyman, you know, whilst whilst he wasn't on the greatest of salary, you know, my my mum and dad made a plan, got bursaries into decent schools. And, and, you know, if you have decent schools and you have decent opportunities and you build your network and you have conversations around the table and, you, you know, you don't, you don't struggle with the same things as people who, you know, grow up in poverty do, right? So, um, so sometimes I judge myself for saying, you know, oh, I, I, I am. Um, I can be courageous because I'm a white man, and people will, you know, because of historic messages, you know, people will take me more seriously. What if I was a black woman? You know, I ask myself, for example, you know. But actually, I think that's misleading, because the beauty of courage, in my view, is that when you act with courage, with authenticity, with um, truth. It is phenomenally powerful. You can't, it can't be faked. It can't be, you know, it can't be disputed because it has, I think, a, um, an undeniable truth to it. So, you know, courage is, is um, in my view as well, I can never say I'm courageous because that's just, that's ego, right? You can say to me, and I can say to you, I believe, you know, wow, that was really courageous. And I think it's really important to honor that feedback when people do say that to us. Because the, the reality is, I might what I do might occur as being courageous to you. But for me, it was just, I don't know, I was just doing stuff, you know. So, so interestingly enough, you know, my, my, my journey around courage, and particularly it was standing up on that bus in Brixton and doing that talk. Was it courage? Mm, I think courage was the, the, the kind of what's the, the, the linchpin or the key or something like that. Why did I do it? Which speaks to your intent, you know, what's the intention? Intention, yeah. Just wanted to connect to Lana. Just wanted to connect. Mm. You know, seeing all these amazing people in this bus, particularly seeing kids who are like being trained to keep your head down, look down at the floor, don't be too much, you know, all of that stuff. And, you know, I was brought up that way as well, because that's, you know, society does expects us to behave in certain ways. Um, the, the, the institution that that is, it is what it is. And then it's up to us to break free or to, to break out of that. Because the magic that lives on the other side of courage is is just spellbinding, and um, so um, what was your question? <laughs> what well, I just right there. What is the magic that's on the other side of courage? Can you describe <laughs> some of those benefits? I think we, we, we forget them and it's good to know that there's something like when you are courageous, you will experience some magic. 
You know, it's really interesting as, as I was going through your notes and stuff and reflecting before this, and even now, I and I will get there, but I, I battle in this moment to, to immediately recall moments where I've been courageous and, I, and magic has shown up. Yeah. And the point is that the ego brings down the, the steel shutters. It's not interested in that stuff, right? The, e the job of the ego is security, safety, predictability, and just don't ruffle feathers and don't upset the boat, right? So I just I just noticed that as I was speaking. So um, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, I mean I, I've got so many, but I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one example that comes to mind. Um, and this one was some years ago. So some years ago, I when was it about ninety seven ninety eight? I was uh, in the process of I made a decision to come back to South Africa. But because I was in a transition, I didn't have a money was a bit tight. I was doing bits and pieces. Um, and I had a conversation with a woman and uh, it were, I was doing some self-development work. That was kind of my introduction in, into this world of self-development. And I said to her, I need to make quite a lot of money in quite a short space of time. Have you got any ideas? <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And she said, yeah, ask for it. I was like, <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Yeah, no, great. No, seriously, have you got any ideas that, you know, that I could earn some money really quickly? And she looked me straight in the eye. She said, you heard me. It's like, I knew she was right. God, and I didn't want her to be right. Because it meant that I had to make myself vulnerable if I was going to do that, right? Yeah. See, all the, all the meaning that we add about, you know, you can't ask for stuff because what does that say about you, right? You know, you're desperate, you're pathetic, you know, all this stuff, self-judgment, you know? And I was like, fine, fine, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and, and I wrote, because uh, in England you post a letter in first class and it gets there the next morning, right? So I wrote 30 letters to family and friends and people who I kind of, mostly thought might be reasonably receptive, but I just thought, you know, just write letters to these people. So I wrote a letter and I said, I'm moving to South Africa. I have a request. Please give me some money to start my new venture. It's not a charity. You won't get the money back, but it'd be really appreciated. Something along those lines. And I sent the message, sent the, put the things in the, in the post. And it was in the early days, just when kind of pages were a thing, just cell phones were just coming in. I, you know, and um, and I got this uh, message on my on my pager that said, "Ring mum urgently." Urgently. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ma. How you doing? I can't believe what you've done. This is so awful and so embarrassing. I've had a call from Shirley. I've had a call from Lizzie. They're you're asking them for money. For God's sake, you've had a private education. What? You know, like this, right? Yeah. And I'm like, you know, noticing the little boy going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the man going, I'm just asking. It's up to them whether they give or not. And um, the, the upshot was, I, I mean, this was back 20 years ago, I got 800 pounds, which was more than enough to cover the airfare and, you know, get me started. The fascinating thing to Lana was that the people who I secretly thought would give didn't. Didn't, yeah. And the people who I thought wouldn't did, including the biggest check I got was for 300 pounds from an old school friend's dad who I hadn't seen for 20 years. What did that teach me? There is opportunity. If you can get over the ego and the, and the judgment and all the reasons you know, the layers of reasons that we shouldn't do something mm. and be persistent and be unattached and be intentional, you know, there is no need for any of us to want. I know I say that as a privileged person, right? I mean, I've never been hungry, voluntarily hungry a day in my life, right? But I know that we are all connected as human beings. And if we can rely and trust on that connection, none of us need to be found wanting.
Yeah. Yeah. The the power of asking. I yeah. always think your your chances of getting a yes are fifty percent just by asking. It's a hundred percent no when you don't ask. So that's my oh, little. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> then there's the there's then there's the the turbo booster, which is called persistence. Do you have yeah. children? Do you have no. children? Okay. So you, we want to model five, six, seven-year-olds. They go on yeah. and, on, and, and on, on and on and on and on and on. And there's no, there's no ego. There's no tantrums. They're just on and on and on and on and on. Yes. No, 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 no. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> So this kind of touched on, because for me, that sounds like an, a good example of a courageous communication that helped you achieve a personal goal, because that was one of the, the topics I wanted to ask you. So there, there was almost a defiance in you when that, that mentor of yours said, just ask for the money, and so you said, fine, I'm going to do it. And then you, you took the courage and you, you mustered the courage, I suppose, and sent those. 30 letters out. Anything else, like or you maybe, you know, just think of other conversations. Like, so those, for me, a courageous conversation is one where the stakes are high and that's why it needs courage because there's so much involved in that conversation. And yet it is the most important conversation to have. And so instead of avoiding it, we should be engaging with it. So bringing our mojo, being fully and powerfully engaged to have that courageous conversation because it will shift things. It may not be the way you want, but at least it shifts in some direction. So besides sometimes just that I'm going to do it, it's a decision moment, and then the courage to act on it, which is your jump in part of and not listening to the obstacles in your mind. Yes. Any other tips you have for us and how we can have more of these courageous conversations? Absolutely. I'm going to pull something up quickly here. Uh, so I just see here. Where is it? Hang on a second. I'm going to just do a quote for you uh, on courage. So Terence McKenna, I don't know if that name means anything to you, but he was a remarkable man. He died relatively young in the 60s and 70s and, and spoke a lot about um, and did a lot of work around psychedelics. Which, by the way, I don't know if you're familiar, but are, are becoming uh, a thing. I mean, the, the 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 research around psychedelics is like it's almost like uh, the equivalent of penicillin uh, in terms of what it's positively doing for the mind. I don't know if you're aware of any of that, but that's that's uh, that's it's really interesting. But what what he wrote about was this. What, what he said was this. It's one of my absolute favorites i'll just dig it out now um hang on a second uh it is worth waiting for <laughs> uh, well while you're looking i'll just comment then i'm i'm cautious about psychedelics and looking outside of ourselves for for awarenesses and so any kind of drug or um alcohol and all of that um I'm far more interested in how do we develop the capacity within ourselves because I yes. believe as humans we have the capacity. We should not be going outside and ingesting things to awaken ourselves or develop our spirituality or, um, yeah, you know, ethics. So that was just my, I don't know if you found the quote, but that is just my, yes, I'm yes. cautious, very cautious about. I know there's a lot of research into it, but I'm still cautious about it. Totally. Yeah. I, I, I think that that's that's definitely a, a conversation for another day. But I, I mean, I hear you because in the context of courage, you know, it's um, uh, that's that's the, the opportunity of courage is here. I am with what I've got right now, and what am I going to do? I can draw from within, actually, to produce significantly different results than just if I did nothing, right? And that develops our capacity yes. so that we can do more and we're stronger in the world and we can handle more. 
So do share, what's the quote? Have you found it? Yeah, so here, here's a quote, and I'm going to tell you a, a, a story which I think you'll really enjoy as a coach uh, on courage as well. So um, this is the quote, it's about a paragraph long. It says this, nature loves courage. You make the commitment and nature will respond to that commitment by removing impossible obstacles. Dream the impossible dream and the world will not grind you under, it will lift you up. This is the trick. This is what all these teachers and philosophers who really counted, who really touched the alchemical gold, this is what they understood. This is the shamanic dance in the waterfall. This is how magic is done. By hurling yourself into the abyss and discovering it's a feather bed. Wow. So, um, let me just go back where I've lost you. I'm fine. <laughs> that is really powerful. I'm going to have to to listen to it again. Um, I'll sure. Um, it I'll send it to you as well. Um, okay, got you back. So here, here's a story which I know you'll appreciate, right? So in 1998, I think it was, I um, I wanted to get into coaching. And so I met this guy referred by family, and he was a very successful executive coach. And he gave me some tips and tools and pointers and so on and so forth. Then I came to South Africa, and um, I was here for six months, and I had to go back and get my paperwork. I was just about to get on the plane to go back. And I'd lost touch with him. And I said, hey, how are you doing? He said, oh, great. Let's meet up. I'd like you to consider coaching me. I was like, huh? OK, I, I didn't have a client. I, you know, I'd done informal coaching, but he wanted me to coach him. I was like, oh, OK. So we met at his very smart office in Piccadilly. And he was starting a kind of, uh, I suppose, what in those days might have been a similar kind of Amazon type venture that, that never made the grade. But he had very credible people. Credible business brains, et cetera, et cetera, it just didn't take off. So he said to me, look, this is the venture that I want to, to start, and I'd like you to coach me, because he obviously saw something in me, you know? I mean, that was amazing, actually. And I think, you know, message to listeners and message to, to myself as well is like, if we just had good energy, if we just had good energy, it's going to see us through life. When I say good energy, present, engaged, in the moment energy. Don't lose sight of the, you know, it's not about the university degrees and the string of this and the, all of that. Show up, be at our best. And I think that's what, that's what he must have seen in me, you know? So I go and see his, him in his office and he says, I want you to think about it. Think about how much you're gonna charge me, right? I'm clueless, absolutely clueless. <laughs> And I walk out of his office and I and I and I think uh, 25 pounds an hour. And this guy is talking serious numbers, right? And and I walk and I take a few steps and I just stop dead in my tracks and I go, ah, hmm. this conversation changes. This conversation about money changes. And then I was like filled with this like amazing feeling of like i'm gonna flip and ask for what i want what i believe it's it's worth and um i, I remember looking up and seeing across from piccadilly square and there was tower records which was, which was a, you know in the days when cds and stuff i i kid you not i mean this is like not cool right i, I walked in <laughs> and i walked out with a whole stack of i didn't have the money for it whole stack of because <laughs> i was I was styling it, baby. Like, I mean, I hadn't even closed any deal. I didn't have any job or anything, but I was like, woohoo, into the big time. That's another lesson for another day, right? So a week yeah. later, we get on the phone. He says, so have you thought about, have you thought about it? I said, yeah, I've thought about it. He said, well, go on and tell me, tell me what your thoughts are. And I threw the kitchen sink at it, man. I, I said, you know, I want because you know, he was talking global i said i want unlimited flights to to and from south africa i want a bonus of x when it starts i, I went i used a, actually it was a little model that he taught me which is called the mega win exercise so you identify what's your mega win that would have you doing absolute click flex down the street what's your super win which is like 80 percent of that what's your win which is maybe 60 percent, and what's your lose and you write down the criteria right and i did that 
Yeah. And I said, uh, and and and, I'm, and I'd like to bill you uh, four thousand pounds a month for three months. That's my suggestion. I mean, and and there's part of me going, "You're such a oh, yeah. You know, I, I <laughs> hear, I could hear my mother in my ears going, "Darling, you've got this first opportunity of a client, and you're going to be all greedy." <laughs> So I said all this to him, and then there was this long, like very long silence. And he says, my God, you've got balls of steel, haven't you? <laughs> and the result was that he, the other, all the big numbers and stuff, he said, we'll, we'll explore those and we'll see how we go. But I accept your proposal to pay you £4,000 a month. But you know what, Lana, two things happened. One is I became a £4,000 a month coach. Yes. And the second thing I noticed is that when he said, my God, you got balls of steel, I didn't care what happened after that. I really didn't. That was the greatest honour that he could have given me, that I could have given myself. Which brings us back to that authentic, knowing your authentic ones and asking it, and how that then builds your capacity. As you said, you rose to the occasion because you showed up, you spoke up, <laughs> and you got it. So well done. Yeah, what a Thank story. You. Thank you. And I must say, you know, that it comes and goes, comes and yeah. goes. You know, I mean, they, they say, you know, today's transformation is tomorrow's ego trip. You know, I'm always conscious of telling stories that happen 5, 10, 15, 20. It's some of the really good stories and they need to be told. But for me, it's really important to check in with myself. Is this, is this like, what was I doing yesterday? And how, how's my current, you know, how am I doing, you know, currently? Because we lose it, you know. And uh, I mean, I've been going through in my own personal life, like a really challenging situation that's gone on for three months, you know, and I haven't made a breakthrough. It'll come, it'll, you know, in in time it'll come, but it's it's really it's it's really challenging, you know, because I'm both the the, the teacher of Mojo, but more than much more so, I'm the student. Yeah, and and that um, says something about your authenticity and your your fallibility, and I think makes you a good teacher of Mojo is that you're able to admit that you're still a student. Because I th I find the same with courageous conversations. I, it's my passion to to help people have them more often, and I stumble and I have slip ups and I have conversations that don't go. And then I, but I always go back to okay, what are the basics? Let's you know reassess this. How do I go back in and try again from it? Back to the basics of respecting each other and and finding the courage to just say what needs to be said but you know often find it's about how we say it not that we should or shouldn't say it it's, it's the how absolutely absolutely yeah and I, I must just take a moment if i may just and i'd love to have a conversation with you outside of this and maybe there's you know is i'm i'm so impressed by what you've done like and and my and and so my experience is that you know here's a woman who has been at it like you, you just at it like I went on your website and all these I mean that thing since when 2016 <laughs> I started in 2004 as a coach yeah <laughs> but I'm, I'm talking specifically about the um the the, the podcast and the the, the interviews. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't even remember when. Sorry, it will be on my website. <laughs> it's, it's fabulous. Been... You know, you, you just, and I'm, and I'm really keen to, to pick your brains and learn about that because I, I, this is an area that I have not been courageous in. I've been like, oh, scratching my head, like, oh, what platform yeah. do I use? You know, that perfection is the, is the cancer of progress, you know. Um, and, and like you have been, I still feel like I'm a student to it. Um, and I've literally just, rocked up and stumbled my way through i've and i asked so so just to to reiterate you know some of your the points um i was invited to be a guest on a podcast to talk about my one matchstick story gain another story for another day um and i 
when I finished that interview in this little studio that they'd made in their home, they all in Centurion, so it's like a 45 minute drive from home and all that. I turned to them and I said, I want a show because they were starting like a network. And they just looked at me. I'm like, I'm serious. I want a show on your network and I'm going to call it Let's Talk Possibility. And obviously I've grown now into, you know, started this one, Let's Talk um, communi Courageous Communication. But that, I think, was just the power of asking. They could have said no and I could have, but I knew if I said I want it, I want to do it, this is the day I'll do it on, this is what I really call it, I would learn from them. And they did. They allowed me to have a show. We had it for years. I had co-hosts and I, we learned so much about the medium and all of that. But it was way before podcasts were a thing in this country. So it was really early days. But yeah, just, just to, to give another example of the power of just asking for what you want. And you'll be amazed at how many people are willing to support you and how just you find it may not be that person you ask, but something else happens and the information comes. Well, I, thank you. And what I love about that is, this, is the first two words that you use. Like, how really do you do we ever hear, I want? <laughs> so powerful. I mean, yeah. it's so clear, isn't it? And And it's like, less is more right i mean that's like i can just feel like i'd have got you on the podcast whatever like whatever the podcast <laughs> i want to be on your podcast like there it is right yeah. amazing awesome and so here we are so one more tip from you and then i'm going to ask you um we're going to like close up in that but so you also run a course called courageous public speaking and i just feel like i have to ask um what is your one tip because public speaking is something you've done you've done thousands of these speeches i think not only on stage in front of audiences i mean you've been on the tedx stage but in the buses and you know beaches and wherever you've you've done your impromptu kind of speeches which i just think is wonderful um but people are so scared of speaking up they are just in you know this whole concept of public speaking just puts people in such a place of anxiety and fear and very few people will raise their hands. So what would be just one tip we could leave them with, your, your most useful tip that would get them to just even explore, never mind actually just to speak up in public? You know, it's easy to say something like, well, just stand up. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, but it's it's... For me, that is part of it. Just do it and you'll see that you overcome well, the TFA. Okay, yes. fine. No, 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 good but point. What else? But, but, yeah. So he, here's the thing. When I gave that speech and when I've done this since then, when I gave that speech on that bus, I was clueless about what I wanted to say. I mean, I had a sense that I wanted to talk about ugh, like connection, <laughs> collaboration, togetherness, community. I was going back to South Africa. I was filled with this, ah, you know, but I didn't know what to say. I really didn't know what to say. And it was, a, you know, on the face of it, you know, I think I spoke for about two or three minutes. First minute or minute and a half or something was a disaster. I mean, just a flipping disaster because I'm speaking and no one changes their facial expression from anything other than just, you know, that was it. That was the only feedback I was getting. Absolutely bugger all feedback, right? And then, and I just kept going. I, and I remember this little voice in my head. And I now recognize two voices, the voice of the head, the ego, and the voice of the heart. And, and this guy needs to be turned up. You know, the volume needs to be turned up. And I remember this, the little voice in my head said, just mention Nelson Mandela. Just mention him. And, and then what came out of my mouth after that was, think about Nelson Mandela. And what is the difference between you, me, and him? This is obviously he was still alive then. And then what followed that was nothing. The only difference between him and us is that he's stuck to a commitment. Most of us can't even stick to a commitment for 24 hours, you know, as a, a health goal, a finance goal, a relationship goal. And that was when 
the energies are shifted and then people it was like being a, it was crazy it was like being in a in a comedy club on a saturday night by the time i got off that bus it was raucous <laughs> but i could so easily have given up you know this what is it the the darkest hour is just before dawn so that you know i i i, I would okay let's go back to that that's my tip stand up stand up even if you don't know what to say even if it's in your front room with your family just start speaking i've got the story and i, I don't know how and uh, that's beautiful it's the authenticity the feeling that we're after it's not the polished speech that can find that can come later right and the thing that i've realized is that that we all have remarkable stories the trouble is twofold one we don't think our story is worth much because everyone else has got a better story than us and uh yeah so those are the two things one is i don't think oh, oh, oh sorry the other thing is i don't think i've got any stories worth telling right so here's a little tip i came across a, a, a book by a guy called matthew dix called story worthy and in it he has an exercise called homework for life i've been doing this since the 18th of october last year every day you get you pull up a spreadsheet and every day you have one cell a kind of a long cell of an excel spreadsheet and you write your highlight story of the day sometimes it might be like whoa you know and other times nah, doesn't matter keep adding 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 the story i've got now however many days it is since the 18th of october and some days it's three four five micro stories in a day so Lana, I look through my list and it is reams and reams of actually incredible content. I mean, incredible content, right? So I'll give you an example. So, and, and the beautiful thing is the content is you can, you can pull it all in together. You can make stuff happen. You can, it can be posts, they can be all of that. So just a silly little thing is that my wife is Sutu speaking. So my mother-in-law lives with us. My, my two daughters, my eldest daughter, like she's, she's, you know she's mixed race so she's trying to you know where does she stand what's her culture where, where is she what's going on and she she's a bit like me she thinks if she can speak five words of a language she's fluent right and she's she turned out that she, she's been saying this particular word and which i wasn't party to but the <laughs> the, the the word it's a sutu word and they sound incredibly similar except one one of the words means child the other word means vagina. <laughs> so, so that was an entry, right? I mean, just, yeah. like, mm. I mean, it was very funny <laughs> to me. I was posing myself with laughter in the kitchen, right? Yeah. So I just put that story in. Now, I don't know if it'll go anywhere, but in years to come, I'll look at that story and I'll look at another story and it'll become a talk that I deliver about communication, for example, the subtleties of communication. So that's a little tip that I that I really recommend. It's um it's been unendingly fascinating and funny and interesting. So we all have remarkable okay. stories every single day. I mean, just as a as a case in point, if I said to you, you know, think back 10 years ago, eight years ago, 20 years ago, tell me what was happening. Like most of us will go, uh, uh and we one thing from that thing. A year act with stories and experiences. So the, the courageous public speaking is I help people to, to get their stories out and actually uh, speak, their, speak their truth, speak their wisdom and be received by audiences, to be mesmerized by audiences for the amazing stories that they are. And the gesture you were doing there, you were saying that for those that maybe are just listening and not seeing the video, is the gesture from your heart. It's the bringing out from the heart the story that's on your heart that and only you can tell that story because you've experienced it so yeah yeah super. yeah thank you Maya Angelo said there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story yeah it's a huge power in sharing stories and I love hearing them mm -hmm. so how can people get hold of you as we wrap up then with our story today <laughs> Thank you. So I, I think that, you know, the best thing is just go to my website, which is simoneekin.com. Uh, and Ekin is like Nike backwards, E-K-I-N. Um, and then from there, please make contact. I, 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 I love 
you know, don't please don't think, oh, you know, he's probably so busy, he won't want to talk to me. Just give it a shot. Just courageously ah. reach out to me. I would exactly <laughs> ask. I would I would dearly love that. And and I think I and I gave you various links for for social media profiles and and stuff like that. Um yeah. question, if I may, uh to you kind of for the audience is is there anything that I could offer the audience, knowing your audience as you do? Is there anything do you think that I could add, knowing the kinds of challenges or particular challenge that they have? Is there anything that pops into your mind? Um, I think you, you've added a lot of content for us to, you know, food for thought. I don't know if you have something that you're referring to or thinking of. Well, I mean, Okay, so let, maybe no, I wasn't, but I, but I am now. So what I'll do, if I may, <laughs> is um, I, I, I developed a, a little uh, online tool called the Mojometer. Yeah. So maybe that's something that you could put in your notes, or where, do, I don't know if you mail out, you know, uh, um, notifications of your shows. Do you? I am. I shared you my newsletter, but above, below this will be the show notes. So okay. yes, we'll put a link please, there. Sure, and please add me to that, by the way. Um, but if you, there's a link, and I think I put it in the links I gave you, it's called the Mojo Meter or Mojometer. If you fill that in, and then you can you can give, do a little bit of a self assessment on where how you rate your mojo, that might be quite useful for your listeners. Yeah, it's always good to to see where where you are, and then do it again a couple of months later after you've done some work around that uh, magic obstacle, jumping in and observing, and then you can see how it's grown. Great stuff. So Fabulous. then to to sum off, I like to always ask this question to everyone. Like, what is the conversation you believe we need to be having more of today that would make the world a better place? It's, um, you know, I, this is in the South African context because we, you know, we have a lot of particular challenges in South Africa. Um, you've got to stop thinking we're different. You know, are there differences? Absolutely. Cultural, gender, etc. But but our hearts are united. We are all together. You know, and so um, you know, the ego is very subtle and very powerful uh, and very influential. So the conversation I would like to recommend all of us have more of is reaching out and being inclusive particularly when it's uncomfortable and extending a hand to people who we normally wouldn't pay any attention to, um, to take a risk. Um, and it's a, sometimes I sign off my email with, um, don't be safe, take a risk. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But I think this, this, this notion, Talana, of, of we are one is, is breathtakingly beautiful and simple and actually true. Um, because all the division and the separation that we're experiencing in the world is all is all ego. It's all ego. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, beautifully. What a what a sentiment. This has been Let's Talk Courageous Communication with me, Talana Simpson. If you would like to know more or see some of our other shows, please go to innercoaching.co.za forward slash talk communication. And we'd love to hear from you, how you have found your mojo again, how you've grown it and how you are applying it in your life today. So do get in touch and let Simon and myself know how you have activated and used your mojo today. Thank you for listening and I look forward to our next Courageous Conversations.